Well, welcome to today's live event, a conversation with Philip S. Gorski and Samuel L. Perry about their new book, The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy. Uh, the book was published last month by Oxford University Press and is widely available. We still have people filing into the webinar room, but we are going to go ahead and get started. Today's event is sponsored by Christians Against Christian Nationalism, a grassroots campaign that has been coordinated and managed by BJC, or Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, for almost three years. BJC is a faith-based advocacy and education group dedicated to protecting everyone's faith freedom. Many of you joining us today are already engaged with Christians Against Christian Nationalism and or BJC. And I just want to say we are so grateful for your engagement and your support. If you want to learn more about Christians Against Christian Nationalism and Baptist Joint Committee and sign up to get our updates on future programming and other ways to get involved, we are going to include links in the chat box now. Our format for conversation today is a book talk where I will ask the author some questions about their book and give them an opportunity to share with us. Several questions, including many submitted in advance by those who registered to join us live today, um, are, are already on my list. But we are going to also have time, hopefully, to take some of your live questions. And so as you, if you have questions as we talk today, I hope that you will submit those in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, we have an hour today to talk, so we will do our best to get to questions, uh, but we do have a tight program. I am now going to give a short introduction of our co-authors. This is the book, The Flag and the Cross. I can highly recommend it. Uh, we are going to put links in the chat here as well um, for uh, you all, if you have not yet purchased the book, where you can find the book online or in your local bookstores. Um, just a short introduction of our authors. Philip S. Gorski is professor of sociology at Yale University. He is a comparative and historical sociologist who writes on religion and politics in early modern and modern Europe and in North America. His work has been featured in a number of different publications, and he is the author most recently of American Babylon, Christianity and Democracy Before and After Trump from 2020, and American Covenant, a history of civil religion from the Puritans to the present. Samuel L. Perry is a sociologist of American religion, race, politics, sexuality, and families, and serves as associate professor of sociology at the University of Oklahoma. In addition to his scholarship in leading scientific journals, he has written for many different news outlets like the Washington Post and Time Magazine. He is the co-author or author of Growing God's Family from 2017, Addicted to Lust in 2019, and Taking America Back for God uh, in 2020, a book that I know many of our attendees here are very familiar with as well. Um, so just to get us started, uh, Professor Perry, you have um, are familiar to many of us in the Christians Against Christian Nationalism community. You have uh, helped contribute to some of our resources, like our What is Christian Nationalism one-pager. Um, and so just to get us started, uh, just curious about how your thinking and approach to Christian nationalism has changed um, from your 2020 book um, to this, your newest book that we're here to discuss today. Hey, Amanda, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to be able to share a little bit, and, and we're really just grateful for uh, time to be able to share research and about this book that we're really excited about. Uh, I think uh, that's a first. That's a great first question, uh, and I think one of the things that we wanted to underscore in this book uh, uh, that is different from taking America back for God. Taking America back for God, we really wanted to provide a a statistical layout uh, and survey of the landscape of Christian nationalism. One that 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 really looked at uh, how common that was within the broader population, and we wanted to see. Uh, how it correlated with general trends uh, in terms of voting patterns, uh, religious demographics. We really wanted to provide a, a very lengthy uh, uh, treatment on this broad topic of Christian nationalism. In our more, more recent book, 
Uh, Phil and I tried to be a little bit more direct to discuss the threat of what we call white Christian nationalism. So something that we've we have tried to uh, emphasize within the last few years of talking about Christian nationalism is that the phenomenon we're looking at and what, what we feel like is the, the most dangerous strain of Christian nationalism is really white Christian nationalism. We say that, we, we document this in the book, our indicators of Christian nationalism uh, really perform quite differently depending on who you ask. And, and this is one of the more fascinating things we've discovered as we've collected survey data. So for example, uh, when you ask white Americans questions about Christian nationalism, whether they think the nation should be a, a Christian nation, whether, you, whether they think the, fe the federal government should institutionalize our Christian identity and privilege Christianity above others, uh, they tend to think nostalgically for a time that people like us, the right people, were in charge. And they, they, they want to, uh, they want to it, it, it seems to elicit ideas of uh, anti-democratic, the, the, uh, even authoritarian violence connected to wanting to make sure the nation stays for people like us. Oftentimes, though, we found in, the, in, in our survey data when, say, African-Americans answer those same questions about Christian nationalism, they tend not to think nostalgically for a time that, that when the right people were in charge or where things were so much better, they tend to think aspirational. They tend to think uh, about a time uh, or about principles, creeds that America was, was supposed to be about but never quite lived up to. Uh, and so one of the things that we want to stress in our recent book is that this, this really dangerous phenomenon of white Christian nationalism, what we identify as a threat to democracy and something that is in support of authoritarian violence, uh, hierarchical order, uh, rigid boundaries that keep people like them out and keep people like us in power, is really uh, uh, associated with uh, white racial identity. And, and those two things are so powerfully related historically and uh, in our contemporary day as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Professor Gorski or Phil, um, welcome to the Christians Against Christian Nationalism community. Um, and this is your first event uh, with us. And so could you just speak a little bit to how you come to this work and your understanding of white Christian nationalism? Uh, so I've been working on religious nationalism for about 20 years and Christian nationalism for maybe 15, mostly academically. and um, you know, came into conversation with, with Sam increasingly about this as our, as our work converged. And I found myself um, sometimes used dropping the phrase white Christian nationalism without really thinking very hard about what that meant. I mean, how was, how, how was Christian nationalism wrapped up with, with ideas about race um, historically? And so that's another thing that we're trying, trying to do with this, with this book is, uh, you know, to show the way in which, you know, for, for some Christians, you know, the idea, their very idea of faith has always been uh, kind of kind of wrapped up with, with race and built around uh, opposition to some sort of racial others, you know, whether it was early on Native Americans or uh, enslaved Africans or uh, later, uh, you know, Mexicans and Spanish and uh, you know, Irish and Italian Catholics and humanists and secularists and Muslims and on, on and on and on, um, you know, so that there's always, you know, for certain, for some Christians, there, Christianity has always been defined, uh, you know, much as much in sort of cultural and, and ethnic terms as opposition uh, to, to, some, to some sort of a, some sort of an other. Um, so that's, that's really, uh, that's really how I, I kind of came to this academically. And then of course, I just uh, became increasingly concerned over the last four or five years as I saw this, uh, you know, turning into an increasingly anti-democratic, powerful and anti-democratic force within uh, the United States. And so, of course, part of our motivation for writing this book uh, is to try to, you know, get the word out and reach out, reach out to a broader audience, you know, because it's important to, to realize that, you know, there, there have always been other strains within Christianity, kind of pluralistic, um, inclusive, uh, uh, you know, versions, which, you know, really understand um, the American project is kind of trying to, you know, create a, find the common good and, and create a, a flourishing society uh, in which Christians and non-Christians uh, could live together. And, um, you know, I think, you know, this is a very appropriate setting, uh, you know, to be presenting that because really, you know, I think one of the most 
earliest and most important thinkers in this in this vein is Roger Williams, who was uh, sometimes seen as one of the, you know, kind of uh, earliest uh, sort of uh, expositors or the Baptist theologians in, in, uh, in the history of the United States. Well, absolutely. And and I keyed in very quickly to your um, positive uh, uh, mentions of Roger Williams in the book. Um, your talk about getting this into a, to the hands of a broader audience, you know, you write in the introduction that your book is a primer on white Christian nationalism, what it is, when it emerged, how it works and where it's headed. Who is your audience for this book and who do you hope reads it and how should they use it? Well, I, so I think our view is that right now we need to create a broad coalition of people in defense of liberal democracy that's going to, you know, reach from the center and the center right sort of, you know, never Trump, former Republican, um, you know, uh, conservative evangelical. So think, you know, like Bill Kristol or David French, and it's got to go all the way to, you know, Bernie Sanders and AOC on the left. And there's a lot of things that folks in that coalition are, are going to disagree about in terms of policy. But I think we're, we're, what we do share is the kind of commitment to a certain kind of a polity, a liberal democratic polity where uh, all of us have an equal voice, where, you know, there's rule of law, where respect for institutions where we, you know, we try as best as we can, you know, to work out our differences and where we can't agree, you know, where we can at least uh, re reach some, some sort of compromise. And so, um, you know, just we're trying to re reach everybody from, you know, uh, kind of conservative, theologically conservative Christians who are upset about what's going on in their own churches or what's going on in the Republican Party to, you know, folks you know, on the socialist left, secular progressives who um, are equally concerned, if maybe for somewhat somewhat different reasons. So we're really trying to reach a pretty pretty broad audience. So I think we're we're you know well aware that they're we're not going to be able to convince everybody, uh, and that there this is why forums like this are really so important because uh, um, you know there's a lot of people who will listen to a lay leader and church or who will listen to a pastor or who will listen to, you know, a neighbor who are not going to listen to a couple of sociologists. Um, and so that's, uh, that's why we're in a way just trying to get the message out to a much broader, much broader public. Well, I think the bulk of our conversation today is going to be focused on modern issues and how we can have white Christian national, how understanding white Christian nationalism can help us understand how to respond to those urgent issues. But before we get there, just a couple of foundational pieces of how to understand white Christian nationalism. In the book, you all have a really fascinating history. Um, and you talk about the narrative underlying white Christian nationalism as a quote unquote deep story, one that has roots going back to at least 1690, um, but that has evolved with time. And so can you give a brief overview of that deep story and what it looks like today? Sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, I think the, the, the basic, the deep story, the basic outlines are gonna be pretty familiar to folks who were sitting in on the webinar, it's something that they will have heard or felt uh, at some point. And it's this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation, that all the founders were Orthodox Christians, that the founding documents were based on biblical principles, um, that uh, God gave the United States some kind of special mission. Um, and uh, in order to achieve that mission uh, and to bless that mission, uh, gave the United States incredible power, power and prosperity. And that that mission and that power and that prosperity are always in danger uh, you know, by the presence of non-Christians or non-whites or non-native born uh, people, whoever the, the other of the day happens to be. And, uh, you know, we kind of compare it a little bit to, a, kind of think of a classic movie script, you know, a movie that's been made and remade two, three, four times, you know, with slight changes to the plot, you know, maybe a different leading actor, maybe 
uh, you know, a different antagonist, you know, maybe a slightly different plot twist. Um, but that is that is the, the the deep story of of Christian nationalism. And people will say, well, okay, sure, but is, in what sense is that Christian? And you know, of course, I think punt on that question to the theologians in the room. Um, you know, whether or not this is Christian in any way, but it certainly does draw on certain elements of scripture. And you know, I think one of the most important is this idea. That uh, that the United States is a, a kind of a promised land. That the Americans are the chosen people. Um, you know, they're in some sense kind of successors um, to, uh, to 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 the ancient Israelites, and that's why you know they're entitled to this land, why it's their land. Why, you know, they're entitled to sort of kick people out uh, in order to, to to take hold of it. So. That, that, that's a story that still in some ways is, you know, it, it's very much alive today. I'll just, you know, say something a little bit, you know, to the, to the Buffalo shooting. And one of the weird things about it is that, I mean, here's this guy, um, you know, on the one hand says, well, you know, all races should be on earth and you know, they just need to kind of stay in their places, you know, wherever it is, you know, their places of origin. So you're sort of scratching your head a little bit. It's like, here's this guy who's from, you know, New York State. His hometown is surrounded by places whose, whose names are, you know, of native origin, you know, Osawaga, et cetera, and et cetera. And then he goes and shoots a bunch of predominantly African-American grocery shoppers whose ancestors were probably also here before his ancestors were here. Right. So why does he think this is his country and his promised land? And I, I think um, that gives you a sense of just how deeply rooted I think this deep story is, uh, you know, in the minds of, of people who don't even identify any Christians like this guy. Yeah. Well, and that gets us right to, I think, the most recent and the most pressing issue on our minds and our hearts today when we think about the awful tragedy this weekend in Buffalo. Um, you know, in the book, you describe white Christian nationalism as having a holy trinity of freedom, order, and violence. And as we talk today, our nation is reeling from yet another mass shooting hate crime. Um, and of course, we speak of the murder of 10 people in a supermarket in Buffalo on Saturday. So how can we understand this latest example of violence? Uh, unfortunately, in a, in a line, just the latest of, of many other such shootings, how do we understand it as motivated by white Christian nationalism? What connections do you see? Yeah, so um, in, in the book, we talk about the, this holy trinity of, of uh, freedom, uh, order, and violence. Uh, and the way that works uh, with white Christian nationalism is, is simple. Uh, the people in power, uh, white Christian men uh, primarily, uh, get the freedom. Uh, they, they, it is, it is their country to do with as they, as they will. They have calling from God, and this is this country rightfully belongs to them. Everybody else gets the order, and that is uh, uh, non-whites, non-Christians, uh, immigrants, and often women included in that sexual minorities as well. And when they violate the order, uh, they get violence, and uh, white Christian men are justified in perpetrating violence. Uh, on their bodies. And what we find again and again, and just our survey date, even before the, sur the, the shooting, uh, we find this pattern that white Christian nationalism is associated with uh, strong support for what we call authoritarian violence, just these expressions of violence that keep the peace, that, that, that keep the order. Uh, it's, it's maybe not violence for violence's own sake. So for example, that when we, when we find Christian nationalism isn't incredibly strongly associated with just saying, you know, um, Hey, a, a world without violence is a good thing. Like everybody agrees on that. That really is, you know, like a, that everybody kind of uh, aspires to an idea of like a world without violence would be a generally good thing. But when we start to ask questions about whether or not you think uh, the best solution to bad guys with guns are good guys with guns, or what you think about the death penalty, or what you think about torture, or what you think about uh, what you think about um, Oh, say, uh, 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 support for the January 6th uh, insurrection, the, the use of violence to be able to overthrow uh, what you feel like is, is unjust 
kind of assaults on your own power. Uh, we find that white Christian nationalism is strongly associated with support for that kind of violence. And so uh, what we see in this, in this Buffalo shooter's even own, own manifesto is, is indicators of white Christian nationalist understandings of how the world works and why he'd be able to exercise that kind of violence. So for example, uh, and I think this is really important that, that he identifies, he says he's not a Christian. Uh, and and I, uh, we're going to talk, uh, we would have talked about this anyways, but what we are finding is that white Christian nationalism really transcends religious identity now. Uh, it is it, it is held by mostly Christians. That's true. So I don't want to just say like it's completely devoid and only non-Christians would, would engage in this. Many, many large proportion of folks who hold white Christian nationalist ideology are self-identified Christians. Yet we find that being a Christian doesn't doesn't doesn't, doesn't qualify you and, and 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 or disqualify you. Like it, it just kind of transcends that. Like this guy, he says, uh, "I'm not a Christian. I haven't asked God for forgiveness. I haven't confessed my sins and put my trust in Jesus." But he tries to live out Christian values, which is amazing as he is writing this, as he's about to go uh, perpetrate his, his act of, of violence. He goes on to say, uh, he talks about what, what are white people? What is whiteness in, in, in this? He talks about white genes. You have to have white genes and you have to have white culture. And what he describes is white culture. Uh, he says this is white culture is caught up. You have to have white culture. It is, it is characterized by the religion of Christianity. Uh, and, and, and that it is what he thinks uh, is is white culture and white genes make you superior? It, it is it is it is the the, the normative uh, 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 group that is that is supposed to be dominant in Western society. Uh, and so think about what I mean. He is he is saying I'm not a Christian. I try to live Christian values, and what I really value is whiteness. Uh, and whiteness is characterized by Christianity, by this religion of Christianity. And he is about to go perpetrate this act of violence on people he feels like falls outside the boundaries of whiteness. Uh, and so white Christian nationalism is, is, is tied up in this and, and who has a right to live, who has a right to be in our country. Uh, when he talks about replacement, when he talks about uh, that, that, that people like them are coming and taking the, the citizenship or the power or the influence, the culture of people like us, he has in mind, not just white people genetically, but white people culturally. And that involves his, his understanding of Christianity as well. So we, we find the two are, are, even in this tragic situation, powerfully connected. Well, and that idea, oh, Phil, did you want to comment on that as well? Okay. Well, that idea of, um, of Christian being somehow code for whiteness, right? And, and you get at this in the book and how white Christian nationalism has evolved with time, has, has become in some ways more coded. Um, and so we have some questions here coming from the audience about, about differentiating between white Christian nationalism now as opposed to 19th century white Christian nationalism and ideas of nativism and, and you know, how that evolution has happened. And then specifically how some other doctrines like doctrine of discovery or manifest destiny, how are those related and, and baked into this white Christian nationalism ideology? Those are both great questions. The one thing that was very different about white Christian nationalism during the 19th century is who the leaders thought leaders, political leaders were, they were predominantly in the kind of um, old colonial mainstream denominations. They were, you know, high church, congregationalist, Presbyterian, Unitarian, um, not uh, sort of more low church evangelical, this is more, more common. Today, so that that right there is really really a big difference. And uh, another difference, and this is kind of more of a subtle theological difference, is that in the 19th century, most white Christian nationalists were post millennialists. That is, they believed that you had to sort of first build the kingdom of God on earth before uh, the return of Christ and uh, and and the final judgment rather than pre-millennial pre millennialists who believe that Christ's return will precede uh, the, the, the earthly kingdom or the earthly, earthly millennium. And what that meant is that they, um, you know, had this notion of 
kind of progressive expansion, reform, you know, civilizing. So, you know, Manifest Destiny was, in some senses, you know, one 19th century version of, of white, white Christian nationalism. And, you know, like uh, contemporary versions, as we all know, it was, you know, wrapped up with sort of uh, kind of racial and religious animosity towards, um, you know, towards Mexicans, towards Catholics, uh, towards, uh, you know, Asian, especially Chinese and Japanese immigrants uh, to, to the West Coast, you know, this idea that, you know, that the United States would expand to the sea and, you know, further south and encompass the southwest, that was the manifest destiny. So it was just like Christian nationalism today, there was this complicated relationship between religion and, and race that, that was really very, very much at the, at the heart of it. And, you know, Sam, your point as well about um, that the shooter, you know, expressly says he's not a Christian and yet is espousing ideas of white Christian nationalism. It reminds me in the book how you all describe the MAGA movement as the quote, secularization of white Christian nationalism. Uh, so wondered if, if you all could talk about what you mean by that and how we can best understand the Christian part of white Christian nationalism. Yeah, I think I, in, 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 in some respects, the people who espouse Christian nationalism, uh, uh, especially within certain camps, they really would self-identify as sincere Christians. They hold orthodox views. They go to church. And there's the people sitting next to you in church. So I, I think as Anthea Butler, uh, uh, you know, uh, so powerfully says, I mean, like, if you want to see Christian nationalism, look to the left and right of you at your average church, because it, it actually is far. And that's one of our points in the book is that this is far more pervasive than just a bunch of people attacking the Catholic waving flags. This is actually a, a far more pervasive and, and kind of common thing that builds until it bursts into some kind of, you know, like situation of, of violence given the right conditions. Um, so when we're talking about white Christian nationalism and how do we say, uh, distinguish this from, uh, from other expressions, I, you know, I think, uh, what, what, we, what we have seen for a long time in other parts of the world, say in Europe, this is actually a, a, a lot more common. I, I, I like to think of this as kind of a Europeanization of Christian nationalism in that, in that we are seeing um, it for a long, long time in Europe, people you know, are not going to church. Uh, this is, they're not necessarily expressly religious. And yet they might say something like, this is a Christian nation, but for them, it is almost completely an ethnic statement. It just, it means not Muslim. It means it's ours. It means it's, it's, we, we draw upon the historical identity of who belongs in this nation. And we find that many, many white Americans affirm this kind of idea. And this is what the shooter, uh, I think, uh, you know, was, was, was trying to convey. that This is, a, uh, this is a, a country for people who are not Jewish, not Muslim, not secular. It's for people who espouse Christian values and embrace that kind of identity, even though he wouldn't say spiritually he was one. So you have one contingent that are more evangelical Christian nationalists that really do espouse a uh, theology, a, a deeper theology of this is God's country. He wants it. They have a, more of a sophisticated view of Christian nationalism. And then you, I, think, I, I think you have folks that Christian is, is, is strictly a dog whistle. Uh, it, it is ethnic code uh, for people like us. Uh, and, uh, and so distinguishing between those two is actually really difficult when you can see the the two in the same crowd, honestly, like at the same conference, having those same kinds of conversations, retweeting one another on Twitter. Uh, you, you, you don't need to espouse the beliefs anymore. You just have to be in favor of uh, white Christian ethnoculture being institutionalized in American society. And you subscribe to Christian ideology, Christian or not. Yeah. And I mean, I think that part of it makes it particularly hard to pernicious and difficult Right. To, to root out. Another piece that I find makes Christian nationalism so pernicious is, and this is one part where you talk about views about religious freedom in the book. And of course, that's um, the mission of BJC is advocating for religious freedom for all. And in the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign, you know, the centerpiece is this statement of unifying values, foundational values of religious freedom, constitutional values of religious freedom that can unite people who view other moral, theological, political issues in very different ways, but can be united around those values. 
Um, and, you know, it was really striking in the book, some of the numbers you gave about how, how deeply correlated it was between how likely someone um, was voting, uh, religious freedom was a motivating factor for them to vote and, and that they would vote for Trump in the election. Um, and, you know, I, in the way you also speak to it here is that when you talk about freedom in that Holy Trinity, um, that the freedom rhetoric has turned over the past few decades into religious freedom language, as you write, to use to deny minority grievances and privilege their own. Um, so this aspect of white Christian nationalism that actually appropriates this freedom language to suppress freedom and then used in combination with this grievance aspect of modern white Christian nationalism, it makes messaging around religious freedom particularly confusing. Um, so it's a long ex exposition of the question, but you know, if you all could speak to that and, and how you find that and any advice you have um, for this group who's deeply committed to religious freedom. You know, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just add something and maybe Phil can, can jump, in, jump in if he has something to add, but I, I think you're uh, exactly right. The religious freedom language or religious liberty kind of rhetoric has been tremendously successful on the right uh, to be able to defend uh, the use of, uh, of uh, basically be able to discriminate against minority populations and to say that that is uh, their their religious freedom, right? Like that is their, that this isn't uh a legal issue. This isn't discrimination. This is our moral obligation as Christians, which is, you know, a, certainly like a statement about like what kind of Christian and, and what Christians believe. Making universal statements about like what what is Orthodox Christianity, and uh, apparently that involves discriminating. But I think that is the 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 idea that is meant to convey that this is Orthodox Christianity that you have no right to tell us what to do. And so if we decide not to uh, make a cake, or if we decide to 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 only work with certain families in our adoption agency and not others, even though we are taking government money to be able to fund, you know, foster care or those kinds of things. Uh, and, and it's proven tremendously successful for that, for that group uh, to be able to, to use that. But we find that that is another one of those examples of religious dog whistle or coded language that religious freedom we find statistically uh, is powerfully correlated with just the, your desire to, to want to be able to discriminate, to eventually vote for Trump, to prioritize that kind of thing. It is not a reference to like all religious freedom. So for example, people who claim to value religious freedom on surveys or claim to want to vote for that um, aren't, aren't persuaded that Muslims are discriminated against and aren't persuaded that atheists or Jews are discriminated against. They're very persuaded that Christians are, are discriminated against. And that really is kind of the ball game is, is the idea that Christians are under attack and so we need religious freedom to be able to defend ourselves from encroachments from the government. Yeah, I mean, it's really religious freedom refracted through this Holy Trinity again, where it's, you know, freedom for me and order for thee, right? Um, that any government restriction or any kind of, um, you know, kind of social norms that might sort of hem in, uh, you know, my ability to do whatever I please and say, whatever I want, uh, that's, that's just an incredible infringement on my freedom, you know, whereas even if my freedom infringes on the freedom of others to practice their faith or to give their opinion, so I think that's exactly right. Well, thank, thank you for speaking to that. You know, the subtitle of your book is White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy. And you know, I, I believe one of the greatest threats to American democracy right now are, is the voter suppression movement and um, cutting back on voting rights. And so I um, wondered if you could explain how we can understand white Christian nationalism as a driver in the voter suppression movement that is sweeping the country. So at the, at the core of uh, at the core of Christian nationalism is the idea. White Christian nationalism is the idea that America is for people like us, uh, and so it is it is fundamentally anti democratic in that it, it is it is not uh, persuaded that everybody should get the opportunity to contribute uh, to uh, to civil society, to contribute their own culture, to contribute to to share in the political power, uh, to be able to to make decisions. That is antithetical to white Christian nationalist ideology, and we find that borne out. So uh, we find in the book that say. 
white Christian nationalism is powerfully associated with, even before, this is, is something I want to uh, uh, state at the outset, we conducted some of these surveys before the 2020 election ever took place. And so some of these questions we're asking before there was any charge of a stolen election, before there was a big lie, before there was any kind of talk of, of tampering, uh, we found that white Christian nationalism was powerfully associated with, with white Americans thinking we already make it too easy to vote, uh, with them already supporting hypothetical restrictions on voting, like having to pass a civics test, uh, having to, or, or being able to disenfranchise certain felons for a long, long time, uh, that they felt like voter fraud was already rampant, uh, and that voter suppression was not a problem at all. Uh, and so this is even before the election took place. And so what's going on there? Well, it, it's, it is because white Christian nationalism looks to, to circumscribe access uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the levers of power, uh, to the levers of cultural influence. Uh, just uh, it, building on that, we found that uh, white Christian nationalism is, 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 is negatively associated. So the more you affirm Christian nationalism, the less concerned you are about gerrymandering. Uh, why is that the case? I mean, wouldn't you want to like make it make congressional elections fair? No, absolutely not. Not when those things happen to benefit the group that you identify with. And so uh, it is it is fundamentally anti-democratic. We, we see that in, say, the violence of January 6th, but we also see that in more, more mundane efforts of just desire to curb access uh, to the voting booth. And this is something that is historical. It's ongoing, but we see it uh, powerfully expressed now. Uh, I'll just add this. Subsequently, we, we conducted a survey. This didn't make it into the book. This is a survey that we did after. We had already sent off things to the publisher. And uh, we conducted a survey in August 2021. And we asked Americans just a question, uh, is voting a right or is it a privilege? Now, most Americans think voting is a right. And I'm thankful for that. That's, that's correct. That voting is a right. Uh, but we found that the more white Americans affirm Christian nationalist theology, the more they think it's a privilege, not a right. Uh, in other words, it is not something that shall not be infringed, but it's something that we can limit, something that we can take away uh, if we want to. And I think that really gets to the core of Christian nationalism's relationship to democracy. It's a privilege that we we offer some people, not a right that everybody gets. Yeah, I just want to sort of um, address one sort of paradoxical thing about the relationship between Christian nationalism and democracy, just that you, you, you'll find, um, you know, very high levels of belief that uh, amongst white Christian nationalism that American democracy is under threat and that American democracy needs to be defended higher, in fact, than you would find amongst folks who reject white Christian nationalism. And, you know, at first blush, it's kind of kind of a head scratcher. But here, here's what's really here's what's going on, which is that um, there is a view that, um, you know, or let me put it even more concretely. You probably have seen uh, sort of uh, kind of folks in MAGA hats on TikTok or on social media, or whatever, saying, you know, we the people, right? And the thing to understand is when they say we the people, they mean we, not you, us. Um, so that, you know, for them, democracy means rule by the people, but people like us. And so, you know, other folks who aren't like us shouldn't get the vote at all or should be made too easy, you know, or, you know, certainly, you know, we should understand that the privilege that, that that can be taken away. So they don't understand that aspect of democracy at all in terms of a right. They understand it in terms of an identity. And there is a deep irony that the people who would want to impose civics tests um, to vote would likely fail those civics tests themselves, given their understanding of constitutional principles <laughs> and labeling voting as a privilege, for example, um, here. It, it, so I think I want to move some, I mean, the, the threats of Christian nationalism are rampant, um, you know, threats to religious freedom, of course, uh, threats to physical um, liberty and, and safety, as we saw in Buffalo, threats to, to voting rights. Um, this group, and these are questions that came before the webinar, questions that are coming in now, are really invested on how they can help, what they can do to help turn the tide. And, and there were some questions here of just asking for a differentiation between nationalism and patriotism. And, um, and so if, if you all could speak to that and how patriotic values can help push back against white Christian nationalism. 
So one way we talk about this in the book is um, scholars make a distinction often between what they call civic nationalism and ethnic nationalism. Civic nationalism means, you know, the nation is based on a set of principles and a set of institutions like, you know, the ideas of you know, freedom, and equality, and pluribus unum, and institutions like separation of powers and free and fair elections and so on. And so that that could be that's 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 civic patriot. So anybody who affirms those values and agrees to support pledges or support those institutions, that's what patriotism means. I think nationalism says, you know, the nation is based on, you know, your birth, your descent, your culture, being a member of a particular ethnocultural tribe. And, you know, we're only going to admit you, um, you know, into our tribe if you uh, go along with our ways and accept, accept our hierarchies. And otherwise, you know, there's no, no place for you here. And I think that's, that's, that's one way we talk about this difference between patriotism and, and, and nationalism, right? Is one is based on principles and institutions, that's patriotism, and the other is based on kind of ethnicity and and uh, you know, eth your ethnocultural tribe. Thank you. Um, well, in the final section of your book, um, under the title, uh, What Can Be Done, um, which is, I think, I, for those who have not read the book, the, the last chapter is incredibly uh, alarming. Um, but I think in a in a sobering way, not in a in a hyperbolic way, unfortunately. Um, and so, but then to end on a more, um, I think, positive um, note that there is there are things that can be done now, and that this is a pivotal point. Um, but you write the answer will depend in part on which path white Christians choose, but it will also depend on whether secular progressives are willing to ally with people of faith who share their commitment to liberal democracy. And you point out that some in these groups may share deep disagreement about policy is issues, such as abortion and inequality, but also an overarching consensus about liberal democratic principles, such as voting rights, racial justice, freedom of religion, and the rule of law. So I'm really encouraged by your outlook here. And I also agree. I think Christians Against Christian Nationalism is an example of such a project of people who disagree on a number of different issues, but can agree on these foundational values that push back against white Christian nationalism. Um, and I'm also aware that we are living through an incredibly contentious moment. Um, you know, I'm broadcasting to you um, today from across the street from the Supreme Court, where there's an eight foot fence around the entire perimeter um, at, that was put up after the leaked draft of the opinion in the Dobbs case, um, that if, if it became a final opinion would overturn Roe v. Wade. And so I'm just wondering if you can comment on how best to navigate these particularly contentious and divisive times and how we can still come together to push back against white Christian nationalism? Yeah, I think uh, what lies at uh, what lies ahead is, I mean, I think a, a fork in the road, a decision that we all have to make to say that this, this threat is grave enough for us to unite and come together. I think something that we talk about in the book is uh, why didn't the asteroid of COVID unite us as, as a nation? Uh, uh, you know, it, it, would, it would apparently be this situation that we would, we would gladly put partisan differences aside in order to unite to stop this problem that is killing people, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people so that we can cooperate, so that we can work together and solve our problems. Uh, climate change would be this other uh, uh, really uh, difficult problem that we would, we would ostensibly want to unite, and yet it seems to be driving us apart. And, and uh, I think what lies ahead is this other challenge uh, that, is, that is the rise of authoritarian uh, populism. Uh, that 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 seeks to replace democracies across the world with authoritarian uh, regimes uh, that uh, ensconce themselves in political power and and uh, immediately change the rules, uh, sideline the opposition, buy off the refs, and and uh, basically eliminate opportunities to be overturned with fair elections. Uh, and so that could happen in the United States. It absolutely we are absolutely on the path towards that. 
if we don't put aside our differences, this is one uh, op opportunity we don't have to, to fail. So like we, we are given this, like this, this, the challenge of, of the abortion decision is, is a great example. I mean, people are tremendously polarized. Now, the people who are really, really polarized and I think are making very, very strong statements in social media, I think they represent extreme ends of the spectrum. Most Americans, I think if, if you're looking at survey data, Ryan Burge has, has, has often posted really great uh, data. He's a political scientist who you should follow on Twitter who, who is often posting data on these kinds of things. He has stated over and over again and shown, and we can see this in data, that most Americans are somewhere in the middle on these really contentious issues, even abortion. And so uh, there is a lot of, of room to be able to cooperate, to, to dialogue, to conduct, uh, uh, to have real conversations with real people rather than just shouting at one another and going to our corners and just deciding, okay, uh, whoever wins the war uh, wins the country, right? Like that, that seems like a really bad route to take. And so I think the abortion decision is really one great example of, of Yes, we can absolutely stick to principles. Okay, so we can actually stick stick to principles about like what you believe and how you feel like these things ought to go. And yet, at the same time, we have to be willing to cooperate with one another uh, in order to 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 face down the very real threat of of the erosion of our democracy uh, that that lies in store. Thank you. I guess. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Phil. I guess one thing I would I would say, and I think this is a especially important um, argument to make when you're you're speaking with other Christians, is that probably really is no greater danger to Christian witness in the United States than Christian sure. nationalism. Yep. I, you know, I started my career as a you know as a European historian, and you know one of the things that really undermined Christian witness in Western Europe was uh, the embrace of, you know, between throne and altar, the alliance of throne and altar, you know, or going back, you know, what I've called the Constantinian temptation, you know, the, the notion that you, you know, the best way to, to spread the faith or defend the faith is to ally with the state. And we already know how that turns out, um, you know, and we can already see evidence for the kinds of effects that that's having Today and uh, you know the increasing kind of dissociation, even animosity that a lot of younger age cohorts feel towards organized Christianity because they just look at it and say, "Gosh, you know, I mean, that's you just mean like political conservatism by that, right? I mean, that's what you know, that's what they see. Um, and unless you have you know different forms of of, of Christian faith, you know, in which, you know, the people can identify with them, you know, unless you really have, you know, religious freedom, um, that's going to, it's going to undermine, undermine Christian witness. And people just have to be, be very, be very, very clear about that, I think. And the other thing I think people have to be clear about is that, you know, freedom inevitably does lead to disagreement. I mean, if you value freedom, people are going to arrive at, at different views, even about, you know, things that, you know, feel really fundamental, like abortion. And, um, you know, part of what a democratic society is about is the way of, you know, taking those deep disagreements and, and finding, you know, compromises that, that most people, may not, maybe not everybody, but that most people can, can live with. And the alternative to that, you know, I think the last thing I would say is I think there is, uh, you know, a little bit of a kind of a breaking of the chains of memory, you know, I mean, I'm old enough, you know, that I knew, you know, had friends who, um, you know, whose parents or grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust, who fled Nazism or who fled totalitarianism, you know, and I think people need to be very clear, you know, you, there's a lot of things that are frustrating about liberal democracy, there are a lot of ways in which it, you know, doesn't allow us to kind of you know, live up to whatever kind of highest utopian vision we might have, um, you know, about, you know, this society that we live in. But, you know, again, historically, we know what the alternatives are and they are not pretty. Yeah. So this group today is, I think, highly motivated to do something. And, you know, uh, we always like to ask about they're looking for specific actions or tactics, um, things that they can do um, in their communities, uh, you know, 
not everyone here I should know is is a Christian against Christian nationalism. I think mm-hmm. you know we have also people who are non-Christians but who are supportive of what we're doing at Christians against Christian nationalism. So I guess speaking to a diverse audience that we have gathered here, you know, what are some things particularly that Christians can do in their communities? Um, and you know, we have questions about what people who are who are not Christian and um, also might be targeted by white Christian nationalism in different ways. You know, one of the questions was, how can folks like me, non-Christian and transgender, who feel directly imperiled by white Christian nationalism, help to reduce that peril? Um, so, if if you all could speak, maybe some just a direct advice about what. Um, people might be able to do? I mean, I think, um, you know, part of it is to just keep on doing what you guys are doing here at Christians Against Christian Nationalism, which is just very intentionally fostering, you know, relationships and trust across some of the sort of deep differences that we have in contemporary society, whether those be differences of religion, or race, or class, or or gender, um, you know, again, there's lots of uh, good scholarship to show that you know one of the ways to sort of break these cycles um, that lead to lead to escalating cycles of polarization that lead to violence is to kind of build in circuit breakers, you know, people who can act as circuit breakers. Um, and, you know, that's uh, I, anybody who lives, anybody who lives here, because this isn't going to just be, you know, uh, like what happens to the transgender person who lives down the street from you, whether they can feel safe or not, is not just going to depend on the outcome of the next election. It's going to depend on, you know, what happens in your neighborhood and your community, whether people are willing to, you know, be allies, you know, with them when the moment, you know, if there really is a moment of truth where they really are deeply and directly and physically threatened, that's incredibly important. I would say, uh, you know, most, most Americans, I think what, you know, we're often deceived by what we see on social media because I think the loudest voices are the ones that happen to be the most engaged and, Maybe not the most aware, but they're, at the very least, they're the most engaged. And then a lot of stuff that we, what we hear, we, we tend to think that everybody's already decided everybody's polarized and very much engaged in this kind of situation. But most Americans, we, we find on, you know, I, I think statistically, are still somewhere in the middle and they're not very engaged. They're not, they're not aware. They, they're not aware of this, of this danger, this problem. So I think helping people, make people aware of the problem, making people aware that this is a, this is a, uh, something that is, uh, I think, leading our country in a bad direction. It's why we wrote the book. It's why we do things like this. It's why we want to get the word out and write op-eds and, and tell people about this and keep putting it in front of, in front of people's faces, frankly, because it, it it's something that we we don't want to be swept aside as like, oh, that's just the latest thing that people are getting upset about. Like, we really do think the data suggests that this is a problem that even people in the middle, even moderates, should uh, engage uh, not in a not in a catastrophic kind of like fearful kind of way, but like with resolve, say, hey, this is where I stand on this issue. This is a bad thing. And this is something that I'm going to take steps to say, uh, not in my country, because this is not the kind of place that I want my kids to grow up in. This is not the place that. And like Phil said, this is a for 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 Christians uh, who are concerned with what we've traditionally called witness, public witness. Uh, this ought to be a horrifying phenomenon because this is something that is. It, it is so corrosive and so toxic uh, for for public witness to be able to to for for uh, the Buffalo shooter for the Capitol insurrection for people to from uh, you know uh, politicians who claim these kinds of things and tweet them around social media for them to be able to claim Christianity in some way or to claim this is Christian values or Christian culture anything that we're describing resembles anything with respect to Jesus or Christianity ought to be something that all Christians ought to be really motivated to say, you know what, that's not how I understand uh, this works. And, uh, and for folks who are not Christians, I think we can, uh, we can also agree that this is not how we want our country. to work. This is not how democracy works fairly for all of us. Uh, and so I, I think trying to get people in the middle engaged enough to where they can see that this is a problem and, and they can come down on the right side of this kind of thing. It's what we'd like to see. Yeah. 
And, and just one follow-up, one final follow-up to that question is just tactics on how to keep the lines of communication open, right? You know, as we've joked in other conversations, no one has ever self-identified, you know, hi, I'm a white Christian nationalist, you know, for the most part, right? I mean, there might be a few people out there, but certainly not to the degree that white Christian nationalism permeates the culture. And so as far as language and tactics on, on kind of making progress and not shutting down conversations, any, any final words on, on how to do that in congregations and in the broader culture? All right. I'll just say something briefly and then I'll kick it to Phil, but I, I would say like something that we have sought to do throughout all of our discussions is, is to not call people white Christian nationalists. That's like calling somebody a fascist or a racist. It just immediately shuts down the conversation. We prefer to talk about it as an ideology, as, a, as what Andrew White had called it, a cultural framework, this deep story, this vision, uh, something that people can exist on and on a spectrum, right? Like they're not just in a clinical category called white Christian nationalist or not. Uh, because like you said, they, nobody self-identifies this way and, and it's not good to kind of point fingers and say this, you are completely this. I think that is that plays into the wrong hands of just making it an us versus them kind of fight. But, but let's talk about it as an ideology that is harmful, that is anti-Christian, that is anti-democratic, that we want to say, you know what, that's not what we're about. Like, we're not about fascism. We're not about racism. And we're not about white Christian nationalism. I think that's a better way to talk about it. Phil, what would you say? Yeah, that, that, I think that's exactly right. That just, uh, you know, uh, pointing fingers at people is usually a conversation stopper. And um, I mean, I think, I guess one thing I would say in general is that, you know, we all live out stories. You know, we all have deep stories uh, that we use, uh, you know, to sort of understand our world and our, and our place in that world. And, you know, you know, one thing to do really is, you know, just to try to figure out, you know, a uh, way to sort of bring out, the, you know, the better angels and folks to help them, you know, think about a story that, uh, you know, gives them a meaningful you know, uh, role in, in, in their community and in, in, in their family that, you know, draws on, on the kind of language that they understand, whether that's a Christian language or a secular language. Um, you know, it's a, a story about, uh, you know, inclusion, and charity and equity and justice, right? I mean, those, those aspirational values that, you know, are not the, not the property of of Christians or non-Christians or, or anybody else that are really shared by by most Americans in that broad middle that the Sam points to. Well, thank you both. Thank you so much for your time today and even more for your scholarship and for this really wonderful contribution um, to the national conversation. Um, would really encourage our group to um, get the book and to share it widely. I think it's a really helpful piece for to better understand white Christian nationalism. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us here live today. Uh, we had over 500 people join us live on this webinar, which is really wonderful and I think speaks to show how important this issue is to so many people. Um, we will be sending an email, a uh, follow-up email to this webinar to everyone who registered with the link to the webpage where the recording uh, will um, be put up as soon as we have it ready. Um, and uh, check the chat as well for how you can sign up to get updates about how to remain engaged with BJC and with the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign. So thank you all. And we look forward to continuing our work together to push back against white Christian nationalism. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda.